the, the last few verses of chapter 6 and chapter 7. I think, I think we can get, get there, um, at least the main, the main points. Before we begin, why don't we um, pray. Scott Cedar, would you pray for us? Sure. Heavenly Father, we praise your great name. We thank you for the fact that uh, you are our guide, you are our king. And we thank you for the privilege that we just had of going before your throne in grace, in worship and praise. And Father, we pray that you would uh, be with Pastor Robert as he uh, teaches us. May we have attentive ears, and may our hearts be open to your truth. We pray all these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, so again, have your Bibles, open up to Zechariah, but probably just turn back to chapter 1, because I'm going to kind of walk us through the first six chapters, and then we'll be launching out. So we are studying this, this book, uh, which was written by the prophet Zechariah after the exile in the year 520. At least the first part of the book takes place in the year 520. So this is, as I said, after the exile, and Zechariah is, is writing and is ministering to God's people, having returned from Babylon, they were discouraged, they were facing opposition from without, uh, they were facing troubles, uh, kind of a, an indifference from within, as we'll talk more about this morning. And so the Lord raised up Zechariah to give them God's word, uh, to call them to repentance, to assure them of God's purpose and his, his plan, and to teach them also about the coming Messiah, to teach them more about the coming promised king. So we began in chapter 1, of, chapter one verses 1 through 6, was an introduction. Uh, look at verse 3 of chapter 1. Therefore you, Zechariah, say to them, them being the Israelites, the remnant that had returned from um, from Babylon, we're about the year 520, 520. Return to me, and I will return to you. That is, repent. Uh, repent, and I will return to you. Fellowship and favor will be restored. <coughs> then, from verse 7 through chapter 6, there is a series of visions. The night visions, um, likely all given in one night uh, in the year 520, um, eight of them regarding the, the broad theme is the kingdom, uh, regarding God's coming kingdom. The first vision was chapter 1, verses 7 through 17, uh, and it's the vision of the horsemen, the patrolmen. Um, the Lord sent out some angelic, um, some angels to survey the scene. All the world was at rest while God's people were in upheaval, kind of the opposite of how things ought to be and will be with the coming of Christ. Uh, chapter 1, verses 18 through 21 is the second vision, and that deals with the, the final end of God's enemies, that judgment is coming. You have four horns symbolizing God's enemies, four craftsmen, basically those who know how to deal with horns, who know how to kind of take care of uh, the horns, um, and it's uh, symbolic of the final image, final destiny or end of God's enemies. Chapter 2 uh, deals with the flip side of the coin, the final end of God's people, uh, which is the third vision. This was a, a glorious uh, vision. Uh, look at verse 4. Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. And I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord. And I will be the glory in her midst. There's the gospel promise. I will be the glory in her midst. As we gather to worship this morning, God was in our midst. He was in our midst in a unique way that he's not when I have you know, my devotions tomorrow morning. Um, he's, he was, he's in our midst uh, by, by, by covenant promise, in a sense. Um, in a special way, applying his word, the means of grace, to his to his, to his children, to his church. Okay, um, that's vision one through three. Chapter three is vision four, 
visions four and five are at the, they're the heart, they're at the core, they're right at the center, they're the hinge, you know, kind of. Um, chapter three is that glorious picture of Joshua the high priest, who was one of the two leaders in the post-exilic community, and though he'll come more into play today. Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel, who was the governor, who was the house of David, who was the king-like figure. So this was a, a, a vision of Joshua the high priest. He's clothed in filthy, uh, dun-covered clothing. Satan appears at his right hand to accuse him, but then the Lord intervenes and says, Satan, you know, uh, rebuke you, and then his filthy clothes are taken off, and he's clothed with perfect priestly garments, a beautiful picture of our justification, uh, that our sins are put on Christ, and his perfect spotless robe of righteousness is given to us. Fifth vision, chapter 4. The vision of the lampstand, uh, Zechariah sees a, a giant lampstand, and it is fueled by two olive trees, and, uh, and it's, 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 a, it's a vision of how the Lord builds and grows his church. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So those are the two central visions, Joshua his, his being clothed with beautiful garments. And then um, Zerubbabel, the king, sees this vision. Um, um, well, verse, sorry, verse 7. Who are you, a great mountain before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain uh, that the Lord builds his church by his spirit. Okay, uh, then the next two visions, uh, verse vision 6 and 7, are in chapter 5. And these zero in on the covenant community. So we've been more broad, and a more broad, big picture, uh, vision six and seven, zero in more on the covenant community and dealing with, with the remnants of sin within God's people. The flying scroll, which is kind of that big banner that you see you know, when you're at the beach, this big kind of 15 by 20 banner with, with uh, covenant curses on it. And then vision seven, the woman in the basket, the woman wickedness is trying to get out of the basket to do, um, to, to spread her wickedness amongst God's people. But she's shut in the basket, taken away to Babylon, which is where she belongs in, in the, the city, the harlot, the city of Babylon. Um, so there's vision six and seven. The last vision, which rounds them all out, we come full circle. Uh, it's, it's kind of a parallel to Vision 1, the four chariots. If Vision 1, we see four horsemen. In Vision 8, those horsemen have grown to, to tanks. So chariots, which are like you know, the tanks of the ancient Near Eastern world. Uh, and they are on the move, and the Lord is going to uh, bring in, patrol the earth, and bring in his, his kingdom. It goes to the north and to the south, which is where the enemies of God would come from. Babylon. Syria came from the north. Egypt came from the south. So there, there, so there's the eight visions, a real quick, real quick summary. So let's look at chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. This is not another vision. So it's, uh, it's, it's Zechariah is told to go do something. It's kind of like an appendix to the eight visions um, one commentary, one pastor describes it as the key that, that kind of unlocks the eight visions. And so let's, let me read it, then we'll look at it for just a few minutes. The word of the Lord came to me, me being Zechariah, take from the exiles Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon, and go the same day to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take from them silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule on his throne, and there shall be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace shall, shall be between them both. And the crown shall be in the temple of the Lord as a reminder to Helam, Tobijah, Jediah, and Hain, the son of Zephaniah. And those who are far off shall come 
and help to build the temple of the Lord, and ye shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Okay, so here, uh, Zechariah, it's not a vision that he sees, but it's an action that he is told to go do. Now, as I read that, I read that just, you know, kind of my normal reading voice. Um, there's something that, to the original readers and hearers, would be very shocking and would be very surprising. Like, maybe you wrote the wrong thing down. Um, we know that you didn't write the wrong thing down, but you, you might see how, uh, in fact, some, some liberal critical scholars actually say, yeah, the wrong name is, the wrong name is written down here. Um, so what, what is so surprising, seems so out of place, that, that would give us pause? Yes, Jeff, slow your hand, yes. Uh, he's crowning a priest. So he's crowning a priest, right? If I remember that, Joshua is the priest. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about kind of what goes on in just a minute. But this is, this is the real heart of, of the, the passage, the crowning of the priest. So what's the big deal about the crowning of the priest? What's, that seems fine. What's wrong with that? Yeah, Brad? The office of priest and king was supposed to be kept separate. The office of priest and king were supposed to be separate. You're exactly right. They were, they were separate. In fact, there was a, there's a story in the Old Testament. Does anybody remember the story of one of the kings who went in to try to do something a priest would do, and it did not work out well. Jonathan, you remember that story? Uh, Saul. Saul, yes. Saul tried to offer sacrifice, absolutely. But, but even, um, I guess it would be after Saul, another story in which we see something similar. Yeah, Jeff? Was, was it Uzziah? Uzziah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Uzziah was swollen with pride. I think it's Second Chronicles 26. Um, Uzziah, one of the... He was a king uh, in Judah, swollen with pride, and he goes in to offer um, an offering in the tent of meeting, in, in the temple. So you have the king taking upon himself a priestly, the, the priests were the ones who did the temple stuff, offered the sacrifices, etc. So you have a king doing what priests were supposed to do. How did it, how did it go with Uzziah? What happened to him? He was struck with leprosy, right, as, as a judgment on God. Just one little illustration of these offices were not to be mixed, right? The kings came from the line of Judah. They were descendants of Judah. The priests came from the line of who? Who was the line of priests in the Old Testament? Aaron, right? It was the, they were from the line of Aaron. So let's, let's kind of walk through this, this passage, but that's the thing. That is the, the really big deal that we should, we'll pause and think, okay, why, we talked about why this would give pause, but it does happen, and the Lord actually tells Zechariah to do it, so we must need to learn something from that, so what are we to learn from that? That's where we're going to go. Okay, so look back in nine, uh, verse 9, the word of the Lord came to me, take from the exile, there's three exiles that are named, likely these are folks who have just come a new from Babylon. They just made the trek from uh, Babylon uh, back to uh, back to Jerusalem. Uh, three folks: Heldai, Tobijah, and Jedaiah, who have arrived from Babylon and go the same day to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. So the Lord tells Zechariah, "Go to this guy's house. Go to Josiah's house, and there you're going to find three returned exiles." So there'll be a lot of folks in this. In this house, um, he is to take from them silver and gold, so silver and gold, and make a crown and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Zehozadak, the high priest, and we'll stop there. So there's the action, it's pretty straightforward. Zechariah, go to this guy's house, you'll get some, you'll get some uh, gold and silver that likely been brought from, from Babylon, make a crown, put it on Joshua's head. Okay, so there's what's going on. What, what should we, what, what can we learn from that? Or what should we learn from that? Um, yeah, I'll just open it up. What, what can we learn from you have a priest being crowned? Any thoughts? What is that? Yep. This looks forward to Christ who fulfills both offices. Very good. Yes, we're good students here. Yes, this looks forward to Christ 
who fulfills both offices. Both which two offices? Priest and king. Priest and king. So again, in the Old Testament, there's three main offices that are that are all anointed as they're set apart with the literal pouring of oil. Prophets, priests, and kings, and we'll put prophets over to the side for just a minute. Uh, Jesus is our final prophet as well, but now we're thinking priest and king. So throughout the Old Testament, we have priests doing their thing. They're the line of Aaron, offering their sacrifices, um, uh, you know, duties around the, t- uh, the tabernacle and temple. And then we have the kingly line, the line of Judah, and they are separate. Uh, there the twain shall meet. Except they will all be fulfilled in Jesus, who is our great prophet, priest, and king. All that the prophets did, their sacrifices, um, uh, there is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He is our great uh, priest. Also, the kingly office is fulfilled in one person, one person, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our great priest king. He is our great priest king. Um, okay, so let's think. Though. Are there maybe some hints in the Old Testament that at some point these two offices will be reunited? So are there some hints in the Old Testament that at some point, as God is accomplishing his purpose, these offices of priest and king will be united in one person. Are there are some maybe subtle little hints that we can look back on and say, wow, you know, there's actually a lot, a lot going on there. Any, any thoughts? No, can you one? Excellent. Yes, he is the one. Like, he is the big one. Um, if I remember the kind of shadowy, mysterious figure of Melchizedek, turn back to Genesis 14. Melchizedek shows up just, I want to say, I think it's two times in the Old Testament. Once in Genesis 14, and then once again in a psalm, Psalm 110. So let's look at, look at Genesis 14, read verse 17. This is, this is back in the time of Abraham. After Abraham's return from the defeat of these kings, pagan kings, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shiva, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek. So you have this, so Zechariah won a victory. King of Sodom goes out to meet him, likely to try to parlay some kind of relationship between Abraham and the king of Sodom. Abraham wants nothing to do with the king of Sodom. And then we have in verse um, 18, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, Brought out bread and wine, he was a he was priest of God Most High. So there you have kind of a mysterious figure appears out of nowhere, then he kind of just disappears. He is a king of Salem, Jerusalem, king of Jerusalem. He's also a priest of God Most High. Um, so he's a priest and a king. It's one figure that that has close interactions with Abraham. Now go over to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. One of the most quoted psalms in the New Testament for fairly obvious reasons. Uh, It's a messianic psalm looking forward to the coming Messiah and, and King. So look at Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord says, Yahweh, Psalm of David, so David is speaking. Yahweh says to my Lord, so it's, the, it's Yahweh says to the Messiah, think the Father says to the Son. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. <coughs> the Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. There's king language. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people, your, your Messiah, your king, your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You, you Messiah, you King, are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we have Melchizedek, Genesis 14, who combines the priest and the king. 
We have Psalm 110, which looks back on Melchizedek and says, The Messiah who is coming will also be a king and a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And then when you get to Hebrews chapter 7, which we won't take time to look at, Hebrews chapter 7 is an entire chapter which describes Jesus as our great high priest. And we get a lot of information about Melchizedek, who was kind of a type of the Messiah to come. So there are some little hints, not many, but some little hints that the Lord has given us in the Old Testament that these offices, these duties, that we see in the priest, sac offerings, sacrifices, and the king ruling and defending, uh, etc., will be brought together in one person. Everybody, everybody on board? Everybody, everybody following? That's a really big deal, that the Messiah, the king, will be our priest, that our king is our priest, the one who rules us and defends us and protects us and who reigns in his church is the very same one who laid down his life for us, who offered himself as a, an offering without blemish in his, of course, his sinless life, and then rose, and then still is our priest, making intercession for each of his uh, for each of his sheep from the right hand of the Father. Okay, so let's go back to our chapter, uh, chapter 6. So Zechariah is told to make a crown and set it on the head of, Je of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Okay, now, lest we think that somehow Joshua is the actual guy, like Joshua is going to be the guy that fulfills God's promises. Uh, we know that's not the case, because look at, look at what we read next. What we read next is, Behold the man whose name is the branch. In other words, the one that Joshua so crowned, the one that Joshua, as he's crowned, is looking forward to, that is, it's not, the, the main idea is not all about Joshua. He's, he's a symbol. He's pointing us forward. The one who is going to bring all these trees of fulfillment, he is the branch. He is the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. And we get several verses through verse 14 that give us more information about who this coming Messiah is. That the one who is going to be the priest who is our king, he is the one that we've read about in Isaiah and Jeremiah and in other places in the Old Testament. So what do we learn about it? Let's just, just read ahead, just a couple of verses. Um, start reading uh, in verse 12. It says, Behold the man. And then from that point, I guess look through verse... 13, really verses 12 and 13. There's a few things that we learn about this coming Messiah figure. What does it say? What are some things that we are to learn about him? He'll build the temple of the Lord. He'll build the temple of the Lord. Okay, so it says, He shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord. What temple, Elder Carr, what temple... Is in because they were they were actually building the temple. Um, let me they were actually building the temple right then. So is that the temple that is in view? No, you have to say as Christ said, turn out <coughs> in three days I'll raise it up. Right. So clearly, you know, what is in view is 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 Jesus. Right? Jesus in John chapter two, and it says, Destroy this temple. And I will raise it again in three days. And they yell out, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to do it in three days? No, you're crazy. Um, but then John gives us a little editorial comment. It's John 2, 19 to 21. Um, the temple that he was referring to was his body. So the temple in Israel, of course, finds its fulfillment in Jesus. What happens at the temple? Most basically, the temple is where God meets with his people. That's the most basic understanding of the temple. If you want to meet with God before Jesus, you went to the temple. Um, Jesus is the one, is God in the flesh. He is the one who tabernacled amongst us. We are with God as we are in Jesus. So here Jesus is, this is a, 
prophecy looking forward to Jesus and his, his body. But what else? Is there, how else is he building the temple? What kind of stones is Jesus using to build his temple? Living stones. Yeah, he is building his temple, not with, with brick and mortar. Um, we can meet outside, and it's still the church. Um, you had to have the temple. Um, in God's providence, that's where you went. That's why they were rebuilding it. But now that Jesus has come, he's building his temple, 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5, with living stones, with people, with you. Uh, all throughout this world, living stones are being added to the one people of God as Jesus. How is he doing it? Zechariah 4, 6, not by might nor by power, but by his spirit, changing hearts, opening, opening eyes. He is doing the work as the gospel is going forward. So he's building his temple. Absolutely. What else do we learn? Anything else we learn about Jesus in verses 12 and 13? He left his place. What do you see that, Matt? It says, when you branch from this place, you'll branch out from this place. So he left his place, come down, and take on flesh. Yeah, so he left his place. Um, uh, he, he, he came down low. Absolutely. Yep. What else, Jonathan? Um, I'm sorry, I thought I That's okay. saw somewhere where it talked about him, those far off coming in building. Yes, yes. We're going to get there. That's verse 15. Okay. Yes, very good. Yep, those far off being brought in. Um, anything else in verse 12 and 13 that maybe teaches us a little more about who this Messiah and King is going to be? About the Council of Peace. Okay, yeah, the Council of Peace. Where do you see that? in the end of um, 13. Yeah, and, and there shall be a priest on his throne. So again, there we have the combination of priest and king. You have a priest sitting on a throne. Usually kings sit on thrones. But here we have a priest who is the king, the king who is the priest. And a council of peace shall be between them both. You might imagine a little discussion about what that actually is. Um, probably it's, it's the council of peace between the prophet and the priest. I'm sorry, priest and the king. So it is a a council of peace between these two offices united in Christ. Um, but look at verse 13. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor. That's language of glory and majesty that, again, finds its fulfillment in Jesus. As Jesus... As Hebrews 1, 3 tells us, is the very effulgence, a very full, big word, effulgence, the full manifestation of the glory of God is in Jesus Christ. He is the very effulgence of the glory of God. So our Savior, our priest and king, is he is that because he is God. And he is God in the flesh. He is the fullness of God, um, dwells in Christ bodily. Colossians chapter 2 Verse 9. So that speaks to, to Jesus' glory and his, his majesty that he, this morning, I mean, it was the glory and the majesty of the risen Christ that not Saul on his rear, and so, and his heart was, his heart was changed. It wasn't you know, Jesus in the manger there, it was Jesus in the full manifestation of his risen and exalted glory that confronted Saul, who became Paul. Um, 13, it is he, is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule on his throne. That's where Jesus is now. Jesus rose, he ascended, he is, a, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, uh, guiding and directing his church. And there shall be a peace between them both. Okay, then verse 14, uh, the crown shall be in the temple. So this crown that... Zechariah was told to make and put on Joshua was kept in the temple. They put the actual crown in the temple to be a reminder, something of a, something of a, a reminder. Uh, remember in 1 Samuel, you know, here I raised my Ebenezer, that statue was to be a reminder of God's delivering his people. So here, this was to be a reminder of this promise um, of the coming Messiah. And then we come to verses uh, 
15. Let me read verse 15 again, and then a couple things that we can take from it. And those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. So two things I want you to, to kind of zero in on. First, those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. Who is that describing? Who, is, who are those who are far off? I hear some murmurings. I don't think it's murmurings of complaining. I think it's murmurings of the answer. So who was it? The nations. Right, the nations. It's you. You're, you're, I mean, that's, that's you. That is you. Um, so to Zechariah 6, 9 through 15, probably, you know, unless you're reading through the Bible, it's probably is not, you know, on the kind of top of your I remember chapter list. Does that have anything to, to say to us? You're in this. You're actually, you're in this. Um, we are those who are far off. Remember Peter's Pentecost sermon. Um, what does Peter say? This promise is to you and to your children and to who? To all those who are far off, the Gentiles. And we see that as the book of Acts plays out. We see that being fulfilled to all those uh, whom the Lord um, calls to him. So, so this is you. This is you as the Lord is building his church. Those who are far off shall come and help. We actually, God in his amazing mercy, uses sinners and, and, and uh, you know, crooked lines, bruised reeds, like all of us, to carry out his Purpose. You know, this is a church filled with sinners who don't have it all together. Um, but he uses broken vessels like us to carry out his, his purpose. Um, we all have um, relationships with, with unbelievers. We have co-workers. We have friends. We have family members who are not part of God's house. And the Lord uses folks like us. Ordinary folks like us to, to pray for, the, to, for those who don't know the Lord, to pray that, that those in our sphere of influence, their eyes would be opened, their hearts would be softened. He uses crooked sticks to, to carry out his purpose. That's a really encouraging thought. Uh, no matter where the Lord has us, he uses the likes of us to accomplish his purpose. And those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord, and you shall know the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Okay, the last thing to note is this last little phrase. And this shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord. This is a call to holiness. Um, the Lord uses broken, imperfect folks who don't have it all together. But we are called to pursue holiness, and we are called to pursue righteousness, and to, to, to grow in God's favor. And as we do so, the Lord will use us more and more. This is an Old Testament, in a sense, call to, to, to holiness, which we see, you know, 1 Peter 1.16, Be ye holy as I am, as I am holy. Everybody, everybody, everybody good? Have any questions, thoughts, or comments? So that, I think, brings us up to, to where we left off a while back. So any, that's the first main chunk of the book of Zechariah, chapters 1 through 6. Any questions or comments or thoughts? Yeah, Matt? I think the council of peace is a double entendre. Because uh -huh. the, the Lord is still, still talks about the Lord, the Lord's throne, the temple of the Lord. So it's obviously, like you said, yeah. council of peace between the two options of Christ, but also Christ and his Father. So it, it seems to point to the yeah, I mean, there's, Christ goes to build the temple through his sacrifice. Right, right. So, yeah, th there is some discussion on what exactly is the council piece. We have to be a, a little bit cautious because it doesn't, doesn't tell us explicitly, right? So it it's could be the peace between the prophets, as I said, the priests and the kings. Because uh, we know that you know when Uzziah went in the temple, he was struck with leprosy. <laughs> Interestingly, in the book of Nehemiah... Uh, Nehemiah's enemies are going to try to get rid of him by tricking him into going into the temple. 
and he said, I'm, I don't, you know, I, don't, I can't go in there. Um, they said, ah, come on, it's not a big deal. You can go in the temple. Um, and he said, no, I'm not, I'm, I can't do that. Um, so it could be, you know, the priest and, uh, and king. It could be, as he said, what's called the, the covenant of redemption, right? That, that, that pact between the members of the Trinity to redeem a people. We just don't know for sure. Uh, there's a lot of things that, that would work, would fit. So anything else? Okay, I want to just introduce where we're going. I don't want to get too far. Uh, we have about five minutes or so uh, left. Let me kind of tell you where we're going to go. So Zechariah, we can break up, broadly speaking, into two halves. Chapters 1 through 6 is part 1. The general idea is the kingdom, the coming kingdom. Part 2, chapters 9 through 14, and the general theme is the coming king. So we'll see more of the prophecies that we're more familiar with around Christmas time, for example, and around uh, Easter, um, Good Friday and Easter. Those come from the second half of the book, chapters 9 through 14. So the kingdom, 1 through 6, the king, 9 through 14. But there's two in the middle, chapters 7 and 8, which are kind of a hinge, kind of a transition. Uh, They're to be taken together, and there's something of a sermon. Uh, there's something of a sermon that Zechariah um, preaches to, to God's people. Um, so I'm just going to read and kind of set up the question of chapter 7. But I, want, I don't want to get too far into it just with a couple minutes left. Um, so let me read the question, and then I'll give you some stuff to think about uh, in, the, in the week to come. So in the fourth year of King Darius, so we've now moved two years later. So we are two years after chapters 1 through 6. We're in the year 518. So we're a couple years after the night visions, and we're a couple years before the temple will be rebuilt, will be finished, excuse me, in 515. So we're in between 520 and and 515. So we're in the year 518. So in the fourth year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, which is Chislev. Now the people of Bethel had sent Shahrazer and Regem Melech and their men to entreat the favor of the Lord, saying to the priests of the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophets, Should I weep and abstain in the fifth month as I have done for so many years? Because here's the question that we're going to think about more next week. So this, this town of Bethel, city of Bethel, sent some representatives to the prophet with a question. Do we need to keep fasting? So, after the, the folks from the exile returned, returned back, they, they initiated a series of fasts uh, to remember, uh, to remember, uh, to commemorate the destruction of the temple. Uh, fasting in the Old Testament was a sign of mourning uh, and, and repentance and contrition. So their question was, now that the temple is being rebuilt, should we keep fasting? That's the question. And the Lord never answers their question. The Lord basically says, I'm just going to, we'll, we'll go and get this and then we'll stop. The Lord basically says, why have you been fasting in the first place? So they say, should we stop this, this ritual sign of repentance? To which the Lord says, why have you been doing it in the first place? So, you know, the Lord has a funny way of, of answering questions with questions. If you read Jesus, he's a master at, you know, kind of answering questions with questions and really getting to the heart of the matter. Um, you know, oftentimes our questions are kind of surfacy, and he, as the master teacher, can kind of pierce right to our hearts. And chapter 7 is going to pierce to our hearts. Chapter 7 is going to get to the question of why we do what we do. It's going to be more negative. Chapter 8 is going to be more positive. Taken together, one big unit, seven more negative, 
eight more positive. And it's going to search our hearts, why we do what we do, why have you been fasting in the first place? That's what I want to think about. That's where we're going to go. So I don't want to go too far um, and kind of give away the answer. But we're a little bit early, which is fine. Um, but any thoughts, questions, or comments on anything we've covered um, covered thus far? So we'll be able to slow down a little bit more starting next week. And I'll be asking a lot of folks to read because we'll have a lot of cross-references and kind of just slowly work our way starting in Zechariah chapter 7. Anything, comments or questions, reflections? Clear as mud. Okay. All right, well, let's pray, and then um, we'll be done. So, Phil Poe, would you close us in prayer? Our Father, we, um, we thank you for, for your word and uh, these, these prophecies of our Lord and uh, his coming kingdom and the, uh, the, the future at that time building of the church of which you have made us living stones and uh, we thank you that we have this uh, holy instruction that we have to guide our thoughts to anchor our souls to anchor our faith in your truth and uh, we pray you will continue to uh, Give us your blessing as we study uh, these prophets. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for paying good attention. We'll pick it up next week.